are we feeling then as we have traversed this amazing journey that the unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ and of God's purpose holds out to us? For in the very first chapter, we had the one like unto the Son of Man who took the book out of the hand that he might read it. And as we have followed that journey, we have seen the revelation that the Lord Jesus Christ himself was given from his Father and that he came to show to his servants through the hand of his servant John. For there was a time when the Son knew not the day or the hour. And there was a time when the Son did and does. And although we know not the day or the hour, we are indeed not in darkness, for we do know the time and the season. And in his great wisdom, the Father has given us to know of his purpose. And we have seen as we've followed through this book, all those encouraging visions of the time that lay in front of them. And there were all those times when the faithful cried out to God and said, how long? The souls under the altar in chapter 6, perhaps we might think of, whose blood, like Abel's, cried out from the ground and said, how long? Or those who looked forward to the sealing of the servants of God, those who waited in all the generations for the fulfilment of that divine purpose. And as we have followed through, we have seen the destruction of that power that was against God, as we saw it in chapter 18, with the end of Babylon and the end of an apostate system of religion that at this point to which we start in chapter 20 is no longer there. And the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ and the joining of him with his people. So that when we come to chapter 20 now, that almighty purpose has reached another great stage in its fulfilment. Not, not by any means the end, but a really fundamental point. Isn't it ironic that on the very day that we meet, when man glories in the elevation of humankind, and he succeeded in sending another man into space, even a Briton, and we are come here to talk about the eternal purpose of the almighty with the earth, for the earth hath he given to the children of men. It is the earth that he wishes to fill with his glory, with people who know about him. As we well know, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of his glory as the waters cover the sea. And this chapter is all about how that process can begin to take place. So let's start in, shall we, in Revelation chapter 20 and recognise what we're reading about. Of course, there is mention there, isn't there, of an angel who comes down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit. And as we're well familiar with the fact that things are not always quite what they seem in Revelation, are they? That the angel coming down from heaven need not necessarily refer to an actual angel and that heaven may well refer to something other than the literal heavens above us. Indeed, it's very interesting when you think about this angel, isn't it? When you think of what we've already seen in Revelation. And the fact that God has already revealed in his purposes certain other pictures. Right, in fact, from chapter 2, where we had the angel of the ecclesias, and chapter 3, that was really written, wasn't it, to the messengers of those ecclesias at that time, and therefore to ecclesias through all time. And therefore the idea of the messenger, be he heavenly or earthly is there revealed and that's not the only case we have an angel in chapter 10 don't we who is revealed as the angel of the bow who is revealing God's judgments in the earth and really the picture that we have before us is the result of his work as he's gathered the saints and indeed has comprised the saints as they march to that very point from Sinai and now here they are taking their position and ruling for God. You see, don't forget what we read in Hebrews chapter 2. I'm not turning there. The world, sorry, he hath not put in subjection the world to come to the angels. 
He's not put in subjection the world to come to the angels. Our current world is in subjection to the angels under the rulership of the Lord Jesus Christ. For the angels called him Lord, remember, after the resurrection. But the world to come, he's not put in subjection to the angels because it is the domain of his saints, isn't it? It is they who are to take the kingdom and the judgment, as Daniel chapter 7 records. So this angel is a representation of the work of the redeemed of the Lord Jesus. Those who have lived and sought to follow the ways of the Lord Jesus. And you see what this angel is going to do. He's coming with the authority of God himself, isn't he? He's coming from heaven, the place from which ultimately all authority and rule comes. He has the key of the bottomless pit. Or that which is a bottomless, or the abyss. It's the same word that's often translated the deep. It has the idea of the sea, but here it is. He has a great chain in his hand. And what he's going to do with that chain is quite interesting, isn't it? He's clearly there with a restraining force. You can see that. A great chain and a key is going to lock something up. And we'll return to that idea in a little while. You see what he's going to do in verse 2 is, he's going to lay hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. And so, of course, we need to think a little bit more about these terms. We've already met the idea of the dragon in Revelation. Uh, we, we can, in fact, just uh, turn back with me to Revelation chapter 12. And the terms that we find there are quite interesting in, in the context of chapter 20. I referred a few moments ago to the souls under the altar in chapter 6 who were suffering the persecution of pagan Rome. So the empire that, that was there and was not uh, following the Lord Jesus Christ in any sense, indeed it was persecuting his followers as the emperors uh, were there undertaking that. And by the time we get to chapter 12, we're seeing the removal of that sort of form of Rome and the entry of another. But in chapter 12, verse 3, here comes the end of it. There is this great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, following all the features of Daniel's fourth beast in Daniel chapter 7, and therefore relating to Rome. And what he's going to do in verse 9 is that this great dragon was cast out of heaven, it's going to lose its authority and its ruling power that it had. And look what's going to happen to it. Well, it's called in verse 9, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. And look what this devil and Satan, the old serpent and the great dragon, has been doing in verse 10. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them day and night. Now this isn't the kingdom in the sense in which we talk about the kingdom. This is freedom for the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ by the removing of the Roman Empire that was persecuting them. It was going to give rise, ultimately, wasn't it, to another form of Rome that in its turn, in due course, was to persecute the true followers of the Lord Jesus. But at this point, the removal of that Roman pagan power, as we say, would lead to a time, for a short time at least, of freedom. But you notice the terms in which it's expressed. The devil and Satan in verse 9. And the devil and Satan is that which is against the ways of God. The devil is the false accuser, isn't he? And Satan is the adversary, that which is getting in the way. And look at the terms in which he acts in verse 10. He is the accuser of our brethren. So that those followers of the Lord Jesus Christ were persecuted and opposed and falsely accused, weren't they? These faithful followers, as well as others, were accused that they were criminals and they were servants of the living God. There was the devil in action, if you like. 
And there is the old serpent there in verse 9. You see, that's, you appreciate, those are the same phrases that we read in Revelation chapter 20. Now, the particular form in which those terms, in which those powers act, is different here in chapter 12 from what it is in chapter 20. At this point in chapter 20, in chapter 12, sorry, it's the removal of that pagan Roman Empire before Constantine and around the 300s. But the, the, the way that they operate is going to be the same as the removal of the powers that are to bear at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, if you think of the, the time of the Lord Jesus, and in fact the time that happened, there is an amazing sequence of events that happens. You see, when you talk about the old serpent, it's old because it goes all the way back to Genesis, doesn't it? And from the very beginning, the serpent was the first voice that appears that challenges and questions the Almighty God and says, did God really say that? Did God really mean that? That when you take of the fruit, you shall not surely die. And yet, they would die. And so all the way back to Genesis, you can trace opposition and questioning to God. And although the serpent was an amoral creature in that sense, it was a voice of opposition and a voice of challenge to the Almighty. And that voice and that way of thinking has become endemic, hasn't it, to our way of thinking. And that's what we're all fighting against every day of our lives. And the Lord took captive and overcame bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, we read. Now, when that thought and that way of thinking is seen not just in individuals, but writ large in a political environment, then it's in governments, isn't it? And that which is true of the individual becomes true of the whole world and of its power structures. And that's what's being represented here by this old serpent and the devil and Satan. It's not only there in individuals, but when you get all those individuals and you amass them together, well then you have the old serpent in a political form. And here in Revelation chapter 20, that is going to be removed. That is going to be taken out of the way. We, we can get the idea of the dragon as a political power, of course, from the Old Testament and the picture of Egypt in Ezekiel as well. So what we have is a picture of that political opposition to God and his ways being removed. And the way it's going to be removed, of course, as we said before, is through the work of the saints. They are the people who are pictured, aren't they, in chapter 3 when in chapter 2 and, and verse 2 and 3 when they take hold of the dragon that old serpent and cast him in verse 3 into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him this is the work of the saints as they fulfill the purposes of the almighty Mark, Mark was just turning back to uh, Daniel chapter 7 and just reminding ourselves of what we read there as I think this is the equivalent really for what we've just read. So have a look at Daniel chapter 7 and verse 26. The judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it to the end. This is the end of that system that had been persecuting the saints. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. So the whole kingdom is being given to the saints of the Most High. And there is that angel, in the Revelation language, taking hold of all the powers, of all the governments, and locking them up, so to speak. The expression, the free expression of human thinking against the Lord Jesus is being restrained, therefore. That's the language of lock and key, and it's very, very particularly chosen. It's not being entirely destroyed. That would not be the language of lock and key. Indeed, we can read later that at some point it's going to be loosed in Revelation 20. 
So it's not being taken completely destroyed, but it is being locked up to be loosed at a future point. And that's very important, as we shall see. So we have here a picture of human government, fleshly thinking, manifested at large, being locked up through the work of the Lord Jesus and his saints. And you can think of all the ways in which that will happen, that the, that the Old Testament tells us about. All the work that is there, laid out for us in the prophets, in Isaiah, and in Ezekiel, and in all the other places, as the Lord Jesus Christ will begin to set up God's kingdom upon the earth. So we thought about the devil and the Satan, and we've seen both of those aspects at work, and how they're going to be taken out of the way. But there is another fact, if we just go back to Revelation 20, that we find also that begins to emerge in chapter 20, verse 2. And it's very particularly laid out for us at the end of verse 2. It says that this devil and Satan shall be bound a thousand years. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because as we read through the scripture, we find in other places, well, I don't know, uh, we might hear said, well, a day is as a thousand years to the Lord. Why should it be that when we come to this passage, we say, well, this is literally a thousand years but I think there are some very good reasons why that's the case and before I go any further if you haven't yet heard brother Roger Lewis talking on this exact theme uh, then it's really worth hearing I'm not going to replicate all, all the reasons that he gives here but, th but they are fascinating I'll just say for now it's interesting when you look through there is only one other reference to the idea of a year in Revelation. And there, it's even there in the context of a, an hour and a month and a day and a year. I said it in the wrong order. But even then, it's in a kind of symbolic context. In every other case, all the periods that we have are clearly symbolic periods. Half an hour, the space of silence, half, half an hour in heaven. Or three and a half days, which, as Brother Thomas pointed out, was, it really fitted the sense of the symbol, that you'd have dead bodies lying in the street for that period of time in the symbolic picture, whereas in fact it had to represent something like 105 years. You wouldn't have dead bodies for 105 years. So you had to have a symbol to represent that. But why when we come to Revelation 20 do we insist then on, on a thousand years? Well, it's the only time then when you have a clear reference to a number of years openly stated. And just note how many times it occurs. It's there in verse 2 and verse 3. A thousand years till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And the end of verse 4. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Verse 5. The rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. Verse 6. They shall reign with him a thousand years. Verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of the prison. That's six times. Why do you suppose the Lord feels it necessary to tell us a thousand years? In case we should forget. Or in case we should doubt him. That whenever I use these other symbolic pictures and language and ideas of time, now I really mean a thousand years. And just finally, there's a very good reason why that's the case. You see, the Lord wrote this book, didn't he? So that believers in every generation, even if they knew how far through this book they had got, even if they could say, well, we're up to chapter 11 now, or even if they got further, like Brother Thomas, and they were in the time of the vials, and they could see it, there they were in chapter 16, they did not know how long it was going to be till the remaining part would be fulfilled. Because the symbols there provided the cover so that everybody would live on the tiptoe of expectation. But by the time you get to chapter 20, you're beyond that point, aren't you? The kingdom has come. The things revealed in chapter 20, any duration here has no effect on when the Lord would come prior to that. So the Lord doesn't need to conceal it under symbol. He can just tell us plainly, it's a thousand years. And think of all the things that have to happen. The Almighty is not going to wave a magic wand, is he, when he arrives. There are a whole series of events that the scriptures hold out for us. From the time that is necessary for, although that's probably before the thousand years, for the nations to oppose him. But the building of the temple and the gradual process of people coming to understand the ways of God. And then of course there is this little season that we shall speak of 
after that period, <clears throat> or towards the end of that thousand year period. So it's a thousand years, and we think therefore literally. Now you notice what's going to happen then in verse 3, how that devil is destroyed and how he's spoken of. In verse 3 you notice that what he's been doing is he has been deceiving the nations for he's going to do it no more, we read. That's what he's been up to, this devil. From the very beginning we spoke of the action of the serpent and that way of thinking, of doubting and questioning the Almighty. And doubting and questioning and challenging and persecuting his saints all the way through that period. Well, he's not going to do it anymore, says verse 3, because he's going to be locked up and present, prevented so from doing. It's not the only time we read of it. Chapter uh, 20, verses 7 and 8 tell us that Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And verse 8 says, he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. So at some point, this deceptive way of thinking is to re-emerge. And, in fact, it, we have it also again in verse 10. The devil that deceived them. This is human thinking. It, to question and to doubt the Almighty is where it starts. And it's seen in political manifestation all the way through and God is going to destroy it interestingly enough we can see a similar thing within the pages of Revelation elsewhere not just in the book of Revelation not just in chapter 20 in chapter 13 we have that lamb-like dragon beast who is been deceiving them that dwell on the earth or in chapter 18 we can read of Babylon who by thy sorceries all the nations were deceived and in fact, we can read in chapter 19 of the false prophet having deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. As we read through the Old Testament, we've, the New Testament, we find that same characteristic in all kinds of different applications. And not just the New Testament, of course, all the way back in Deuteronomy. That the fear that they might be deceived by false worship. The Apostle speaks of how sin that deceives him or we can be ourselves deceived says James and Paul if we say we have no sin good words and fair speeches or slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive we read in Ephesians or the false teaching which is a deceiver and an antichrist as John writes it so these are all aspects says the apostles of what we have to look out for which are all manifestations of the basic human problem that chapter 20 is all about taking out of the way at least for that period so here's the thing here's the challenge that those who are to rule with Christ in his kingdom are going to be part of God's purpose of taking the opposition to God out of the way for that thousand years the Lord Jesus Christ in his life overcame it completely there was not a moment when he did not choose to follow the ways of his father every thought as we say he took it captive so that he never doubted his father and he never falsely accused his father and therefore it is fitting that he should be the one to reign in righteousness over mankind and those who he has called to himself we'll just turn back to chapter 15 and just note the point. And here in this kingdom vision, verse 2, I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. So there are still mortal nations at this point, here's the sea, but they're mingled with fire. They've been judged. There's a picture of God at work amongst them and them that had gotten the victory they are overcomers that's the idea of this word they are the conquerors just as those who overcome in chapters 2 and 3 God the Lord Jesus says he who overcomes will sit down with me in my throne and the Lord Jesus is not therefore just going to be the only one of course he is ultimately the only one who can overcome but he wants us doesn't he to share day by day in his victory 
ultimately, none of us are going to stand before him and demand our rights, are we? None of us are going to have, be able to present ourselves sinless before him. We're all going to be dependent on his mercy. But all of us will have recognised the critical importance of having died with him to sin and daily try to live to righteousness in our lives and to overcome that with which we struggle where we fail and he succeeded. To rule over the nations in that time requires us to have made every effort in our lives now to, ru to rule ourselves now by his word. So, there is the picture that is held out before us. Here are the thrones of verse 4. Sorry, I'm back in Revelation 20 now. Where there are set thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. That's the picture we saw in Daniel chapter 7. And here are the thrones that were set and promised. And in Psalm 122, we have the thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David, that were particularly promised, weren't they, in Luke 22, to the 12 apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, who were going to rule over the 12 tribes. And that particular responsibility was given to them. Whereas, to help him in that work to the Gentiles, perhaps, would be the lot of others who came from other nations, but who were faithful. There's that verse in Revelation 3. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. This is about the obliteration of every enemy to the purposes of God. It is about us sharing in his victory. Both now in our lives and in that time, ultimately. When not only our sin is taken out of the way. But we share in his work of ridding it from every crevice of the earth. So, there are those thrones, and you can see the work of them in um, verse 6, at the end of verse 6. They are to be the priests of God and of Christ, and to reign with him a thousand years. It's worth just noting, as we read through those verses, that we get to verse 5. And the rest of the dead, says verse 5, live not again until the thousand years were finished. And this is the first resurrection. These verses can sometimes be a little bit tricky as to precisely what, what the apostle is talking about, or what the Lord Jesus is talking about. It's worth just, just considering that a little further. The end of verse 4 is telling us that these faithful ones who had died, who had been martyred for the work of the Lord Jesus, and they lived and reigned with Christ, a thousand years. And that, says the end of verse 5, is the first resurrection. They, these are our brothers and sisters who, having lived through their life, are now sleeping in the dust of the grave. And should the Lord return today, will be united with us who are alive, together to be with the Lord forever, worshipping before him. But that's not the end of the great harvest, is it? That's not the end of all those who shall be with the Lord Jesus ultimately beyond the thousand years for God is going to harvest also those who have been faithful during the thousand years and so this, these are the people of verse 5 that he talks about the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished others who die during the millennium are not going to be raised until the very end of it and as we shall see in a moment to be judged it's almost as though there's brackets around the first part of verse 5. Those who've died during that period are then going to be raised and to be judged. And if they're faithful, will take their place alongside those who have previously lived and been faithful. And to be joined with Christ as a harvest at the end of the millennium. So it's almost as though the first part of verse 5 is in brackets. So we have there then this wonderful hope and those in verse 6 who at this first resurrection for which we wait are to be joined with those faithful that we have loved are again not to be subject to death after that point but to reign with him a thousand years as we've said. 
Now at this point, I'd like to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because it has some fascinating teaching, this wonderful resurrection chapter, which we can put alongside what we've just read about Revelation 20. 1 Corinthians 15, as we well know, the, the Apostle argues in some considerable detail about all the reasons why resurrection is essential and how there is no hope of the kingdom without it. But towards the end of the chapter, or, or the middle of the chapter, he has some very plain teaching. Verse 20, Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept? So there he says, there's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the very beginning of any of the harvest of God's purpose to bring these people to him out of the earth. And there is then to be a period of somewhere, we believe, approximating 2,000 years until he comes again. And the next step in the process is recorded in verse 23. Every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. So there's the first resurrection of which Revelation 20 spoke. There's a resurrection and judgment, and those who are Christ raised. And of course, he's not dealing here in 1 Corinthians 15 with those who are judged and found unworthy. He doesn't talk about judgment at all in 1 Corinthians 15. And that's not because he doesn't believe in judgment. He's going to go on and write a second letter in chapter 5, isn't it? Great length and tell them how important that concept is. But it's not his subject here, any more than it is in, in Revelation 20. He's just talking about the, the, the pathway of those who are found faithful through that judgment. So as far as verse 23 is concerned, those who are faithful are there. Verse 25, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. So here's the work of the thousand years. The work of the Lord Jesus to put down every opposition to him until, at the point, all the earth is fulfilling that marvellous, all those wonderful Old Testament pictures that we have in Isaiah 11 and, and Isaiah 65 and all the others that we rejoice in. That's the work of the millennium. Now, of course, in 1 Corinthians 15, it doesn't tell us how long that period is. It just describes it and the work of it that will ultimately end in the obliteration of sin and death from the earth. Verse 24, and I missed out that deliberately, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. So the end, verse 24 describes, as the point where Jesus hands back the kingdom to God, Sin and death have been taken out of the way. There is not a creature who does not fully reflect the character and the glory of God at that point. For they have either been consigned to death, or they've been made like the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're giving him glory, and doing his will, to the ultimate, as naturally as we breathe or our hearts beat. And the world is full of people like the Lord Jesus Christ. So that God may be all in all, everything in every one. That's our hope, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Ultimately, it's not just the thousand years to which we look. When sin is held captive and its effects are greatly reduced and the saints are there ruling for Christ, but that's not the end. It is when every being gives glory to him. That's his ultimate purpose, to fill the earth with those who know about his glory and are like him. Now, when you add that picture to Revelation 20, if we just turn back there, just see how it illuminates for us what Revelation 20 is saying. You see, we can read there in chapter 20, verse 2, of how this serpent and the devil and Satan is going to be bound a thousand years. So we now know that millennial period is a thousand years, and the work of it, you remember, was to subdue all enemies, said Paul in Corinthians. Well, that's the equivalent of Satan being bound, and the saints are going to do it. And equally, we can understand that that is therefore the reign of the saints that we read of in verse 4, where they're sitting on thrones. And there is to be, though, another period that's described in verse 3, 
And after that he must be loosed a little season, says verse 3. And verse 7, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So in actual fact, there is a short period, a little season, we're not told how long, when Satan shall be loosed. And it fits in just there. And if, brothers and sisters, the work of the angel in binding Satan at the beginning of chapter 20 was the work of the saints in taking hold and obliterating all human government against the Lord Jesus Christ, if that's what binding Satan was, then what is loosing Satan? If binding Satan was the saints under the power of the Lord Jesus taking the kingdom and the judgment sitting and judgment being given to the saints of the Most High and then in due course the temple being built and sacrifice and offering being established and in every place incense and a pure offering to the Lord of hosts if all of that was involved with binding Satan then what is loosing Satan? There's a little clue if you look a bit further on verse 8 says that when Satan is loosed out of his prison, he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Here's the first clue. If Satan is that power of sin which was held back by the saints, not allowing sin to reign so openly in the political establishment, for rulership now over the earth was coming from the saints, and there shall be a voice, perhaps as it's said to mortal Israel, to natural Israel, this is the way walk ye in it. Maybe... Maybe that could be said also across the earth. And if that governance then is withdrawn, then that same human way of thinking, that flesh and blood response, would re-emerge. You know, today you can see the power of sin openly, can't you? There's no question about it. You only have to, to look at the news to know the wickedness of humanity. But in that millennial reign, that will have been taken out of the way. There won't be people going around committing murders and doing all these other dreadful things. There will be a saint there, won't there, in charge. So faith, brothers and sisters, without which it is impossible to come to God, will be in another direction. It won't be like it is now that the Lord Jesus did come and die and rose and will come again because he's there walking in front of them. It won't be that the saints will one day rule the world because the saints will be there ruling the world and they'll see him. It is the faith in those days will be the reality of sin as being as dreadful as it is and flesh and blood being as hopeless as the scriptures reveal it to be when its effects are bound and chained. And yet towards the end of that thousand years is an opportunity for those living to express their faith that what the Almighty has said is true so that when the saints are withdrawn Remember, Satan's being loose, the reverse of how Satan was bound. Then there will be an opportunity, won't there, for people to express their faith. Just incidentally, as they've been doing all through that period in the sacrifices, haven't they? Looking back to Christ. As under the law, they looked forward. Well, here's the other clue in chapter 20. They came up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. This great multitude, this host gathered from all nations. I know it says Gog and Magog in verse 8, but you notice it says that they are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog. They weren't in all four quarters. This is a symbolic description, isn't it, of Gog and Magog. It's got nothing to do with the exact geographical location of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel any more than Babylon or Egypt or Sodom or Jerusalem is mentioned in Jerusalem. They are symbolic terms, aren't they? So here is an opposition to God which is characterised by the opposition that we are going to see or, or observe if we're not here to see it by God's grace as, as Gog and Magog opposed the coming of Jesus. And this is the point at the end of verse 9. They compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. So that these saints who've been distributed and dispersed across the earth during the millennium to fulfil God's purpose and to rule for him in all its four corners, where are they now? They are withdrawn to one central place, aren't they? They are together as it says there in verse 9, 
the camp of the saints and the beloved city which may well be thought of as comprising his people as Revelation 21 describes it in that later phase there but all of those people who together form that heavenly city, the bride but they're together in verse 9 so perhaps they've been withdrawn from all those places as we say that they were and that allows the circumstances then for opposition to re-emerge. And that voice of the serpent thinking that has been held and chained for a thousand years re-emerges. As human thinking is not checked and sin is allowed to grow. Until finally it is taken out of the way. They come and compass the city and seek even to fight against God. And isn't it appropriate then in verse 10 when it says that the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire? What could be more appropriate than to think of that act to try to fight against the Lord God and his son and his saints than to consider that the work of, well... A deceptive force. How more deceived could you be than to think you could fight against the Almighty and his son and his saints? And that's how they do it. You see, it's that way of thinking, isn't it? The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. If ever God was there or his son, well, they're long since forgotten. I can do as I like. No judgment is going to come to me. That's, that's the spirit of man today. If ever God was there, he's not taking any action. And the opposition grows, but it is quashed. And verse 10 tells us that the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. And there is this powerful symbol we've met before in chapter 19, where the beast and the false prophet cast into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And this is the same place in this symbolic language to speak of total destruction, that in the end, even in chapter 20, verse 14, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. And, and it only makes sense, doesn't it, seen in that symbolic context. The destruction of death itself, and the powerful imagery of Revelation, burned up to total destruction. This is the very idea, isn't it? Let's just go back as we begin to bring our thoughts to conclusion in Hosea and just remember the words that we read there because this is the promise of the Almighty that he has in store even the wonders of the millennium itself are going to pale into insignificance to what he has in store beyond it Hosea chapter 13 I will ransom them from the power of the grave I will redeem them from death. O oh, death, I will be thy plagues. O oh, grave, I will be thy destruction. Death itself destroyed, cast into the lake of fire to be no more. And every creature giving glory to the God of heaven. And then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. So that's our hope, brothers and sisters. The end. God all in all. God's purposes brought to completion. Those who had lived, as we read in Revelation chapter 20, through that period, being judged out of that which is written in the books. And there are books which are a day ledger, as it were. They're acts being recorded. And there is the book of life, which their names are being written in if they're faithful. And if that's the description at the end of Revelation 20, it's the same process that's going on now. Because the Lord is still keeping a book. He's keeping record of us, my brothers and sisters, as we seek to serve him, failingly. But as we seek his mercy. And our name has been written in that book. And he has promised not to blot it out if we are seeking after his ways. And if we are truly remaining in him. This is our hope, my brothers and sisters, not only to live in that age, but to be part of the work of God through his Son, as he obliterates sin and finally even death from this world. And thereby we ourselves find the most satisfying work we could ever do to the glory of our Heavenly Father. May we, brothers and sisters, through our life now, 
take the opportunity he has given us to learn how we should walk before him, that we might in his great mercy and through the love he has shown us in his son be permitted to enter into that time and work for him then.